the official Zoomcast of Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp. He's an American guitar legend and musical director for The Conan O'Brien Show. Hear untold stories from Jimmy and his musical guests. They will talk music, its influence, culture, and future on The Green Room with Jimmy Vivino with special guest Elliot Easton from The Cars. Something going on in the green room. Something going on in the green room. Something going on in the green room. Elliot Easton in the green room. Right now, right now, right now, we got Elliot Easton in the green room with Jimmy Vivino. Me. Els, what's up, man? <laughs> hey, Jimmy. How yeah. are you, bro? You know, we talk on the phone so often, I forgot. We, we never see each other. We don't do the FaceTime thing, right? I mean. No, no. No, no. No, it's. <laughs> But the but the conversations I wish I, I I wish I recorded some of them because they're so funny. Well, we're gonna try. I think it keeps us sharp, you know. <laughs> Pop culture junkies. Um, we're living in uh, you know, you and I are like the same age, and we're living in the Dick Tracy world we read about in the comics. Yeah. You know, an Apple Watch that has a, you know, you can talk to somebody and see them. <laughs> Did we ever think that? You know, ever. I don't even want to think about it now. I, you know, I, I hate this culture of like, you know, you look at a table full of kids at a restaurant, they're all staring at their phone and nobody's talking to each other. They're, they're texting to each other across the table. I mean, it's like. I, I know, I know. And also, if you go to order a coffee at Starbucks or wherever you go, and I hate to plug Starbucks at the local, no matter where you go. The, the, they look that nobody looks you in the eye anymore or you know it's like it's just the way that uh you know the world's going but yeah. on the other hand the funny thing is all the things uh we loved about music are uh, the sounds and everything now they have pro tools and not tape but they go backwards and have a, a plug-in that makes it sound like you use tape right. <laughs> or, or or a pedal or even a or a scratchy record, you can do that to it. You can put like the scratches like in it, so it sounds like an old record. So, so let's get right into uh, one of my one of my uh, sort of, you know, a thing that that bugs me a bit. We 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 have pedals now. Everybody's got pedals, right? And they're trying to get the sound of the amps we used to use when we were kids on these pedals. So, uh, what? You know, what do you feel about 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 um, somebody that you you see a pedal board that's got like fifty pedals? I mean, I know you you have a very small three or four pedals you bring, if, especially if you're renting an amp. But what do you think about too many pedals? Well, you know, I, I, I try to keep an open mind about it. You know, there's some guys that rely on it. They like there's there's guys like us that like blues, R and B, rock and roll, bass, guitar players. But some people are into like creating atmospherics and 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 you know that kind of immersive kind of sound and spacey stuff. And for that, you need kind of some wacky stuff and you know some ambient effects and things like that. We don't do you and I don't do so much or called on to do so much of that. But you know, there's some like sound sculpting that you need a lot of crazy stuff for. But like you say, I, you know. For me, like reverb delay, a couple overdrives, you know. <laughs> what do I have? I have, oh, you know what pedal I have that I love? I have Robert Keeley's 30 millisecond pedal, which is, um, the story from it is that uh, Ken Townsend, the, 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 the chief engineer uh, uh, at Abbey Road, uh, he created some, John Lennon hated doubling his vocals. And he so so Ken created something called ADT or right, automatic right, right, double yeah. tracking, yeah. which was just basically, you know, you know what it was. It was a, a tight slap onto another machine. So it well, sounded double, of, slightly very sped. Right. Yeah. So it, it got wider and Lennon loved it. So anyway, Keeley built this pedal. It's a third. It's called 30 millisecond at 30 MS. And it, it doubles your guitar. And they shot Abbey Road's echo chamber, and I've got Abbey Mode in here, <laughs> <laughs> and it's got like the reverb with pre, like pre delay and stuff, and it's it, you know it's it's like an Abbey Road pedal, but it's it's great if you use it in stereo two amps, it really sounds doubled. 
And it's red, I believe, because you turned me on to it. You may have even sent me one. I, I can't remember, but I have one too, because yeah. you knew that I was going for that sound on While My Guitar Gently Weeps, yes. which is that yes. exact sound. That's right. I turned and I think on George to says he was playing with what he called the wobble knob Yeah, <laughs> while Eric was playing, as it was going down. So because Eric... Eric said, you got to do something to make it wobble. It's, it sounds too normal. You got to like beetle it up a little bit or something. <laughs> yeah, he didn't want to sound like him. He was so in awe of those guys. He was like, you got to do one of your magical things to my sound. So people hey, that, got... was a, that was an amazing solo. You know, on, you, on YouTube, if you guys want to find it, there's a, there's a clip of me playing that solo at the Grammy Museum for the, the White Album uh, anniversary. And I, I think I nailed it. I, I, I really worked on it and got every, you know, all the nuances. Well, you know, I've been I've been deep into that solo and still find new places to bend and stuff. You yeah. Know? Uh, yeah, yeah. And and I think we probably uh, compared notes that when we were at David Fishoff's Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp playing a Beatle, a Beatle, you and me and and my guys from the Fab Fo and and we had such a ball there. You oh, know, and that was a I great have, one. Yeah, I didn't think I would have fun at all. Then there you were, my old friend. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, this is easy now. You know. Yeah, yeah. I even I, I remember what's your what's your lefty guitar player's name again? Oh, Frank Agnello. Yeah, Frank, yeah. I loaned Frank my SG. I remember. And, and, and you remember uh, we Lane came into there. that we paired off with different bands. Like we went, two of us went with a band. You were with a band. So I just took all the guys in my room and said, let's go invade Elliot and make him play a car solo for us. Because really, <laughs> what are we here for? We have one of the greatest, you know, creative guitar players uh, in the world in the room next door. And we need to, you guys need to see. No, you need to see this. So, uh, and it was, uh, I can't remember what you played. But getting to that, let's talk about uh, your your band uh, a little bit, the cars. Sure. And, and uh, the fact that... Uh, that people, most people think they're a Boston band. All everybody's from Boston, you know, but not so, right? Where are where is everybody? What is the lineage of that band and the and the history of uh, you know who knew who first and all that stuff that I want to know? I'm sure people would be interested. Well, I'll tell you, um, I I moved to Boston to go to Berkeley College of Music, and so that's what as you know. I grew up in Long Island. Um, let's see, Rick and Ben had, had been together, uh, in Ohio, uh, Ben's from Cleveland, Parma, Ohio. And, um, and they'd been at it since 68. They'd been at it for 10 years before the first Cars album came out. They had a group, uh, they put out an album called Milkwood on ABC Paramount. Uh, it, that in fact, Greg plays on and, um, they they tried various different things throughout the years, you know, trying to make it. And I think those guys were eight, and nine years older than me. And I think that the cars was going to be their last attempt. David Robinson, too, our drummer, uh, to skip over to David, you know, as many people know, came from the Modern Lovers. And but I was the baby of the band. All these guys were older than me. Um, so I think for David too, it was going to be like, if this band doesn't happen, you know, I'm going to toss in my drumsticks. You know? <laughs> for me, I didn't, I, I couldn't have cared. I, I, I was 23 when we made the first record. It was all good to me. I'd never been any, you know, further South than DC. And all of a sudden we're at George Martin's air studio on Oxford street in London with Paul McCartney recording next door. And we're making the record and George Martin's, lying down on the couch in front of the board and listening. And it, 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 to this day, it, it just, it's unbelievable. Oh man. Did you, and, and, and when they bring you the tea and the lamb hot pot during the break. Well, you know what the amazing <laughs> thing was, what was incredible was the faith that, that Electra Records had in us. I mean, we hadn't put out a record yet. We hadn't proved ourselves in any way yet. And here they are, they flew us to England we're recording with Roy Thomas Baker at Air Studios, George Martin's studio. We're living in a house in Mayfair with a Malaysian couple that cooked and cleaned and polished the brass doorknob every morning. I mean, it was, 
They gave us a Jaguar and a Land Rover to get back and forth <laughs> to the studio. And we hadn't put out, we hadn't sold record one yet. I'll back up a little and uh, to make a little sense of that as how the cars got signed. Because yeah, I was, was going to ask you who signed you back then. Well, I'll tell you. It's a very interesting story. Uh, I, you know, maybe you'll agree that in, in any success story, there's a little angel or there's somebody that does you a favor that turns that little trick that you needed to get your foot in the door. It's almost like a catch 22, like, like joining SAG. You can't act if you don't have the card. You can't get the card unless you have. So there was a disc jockey named Max Ann Sartori at WBCN in Boston, which was the, the big rock stations like NEW in New York. And she started playing our demo tape, just a live two track that we did in the studio of Just What I Needed and Best Friends Girl uh, in heavy rotation. And it was getting reported nationally in like the Gavin report and these radio tip sheets that to explain to people who don't know, it's kind of like Billboard magazine where you see the charts, only it's for it's for radio stations. And, and it shows what the major markets are playing that week so that the secondary and smaller towns know what's hot now and what to go with. And she was playing our, our tape in heavy rotation. And so it got reported. And so, you know, you'd see, you'd look at BCN in Boston and there'd be a column for the act, the album or the song and the label. So we'd say like Aerosmith, Back in the Saddle, Columbia, um, Elton John, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, MCA Rocket, The Cars, Just What I Needed, Tape. <laughs> and, and so, you know, I mean, it was getting, we were getting reported nationally on a demo tape. So needless to say, any A&R guy with, with half a brain that sees this is going to say, what the hell's going on in Boston? Who are these cars guys? Yeah, and why don't we have them? <laughs> yeah, they're, they're on top, top in the charts at BCN and they don't have a record out. Yeah. And so from there, um, you know, we, we, we got a, low, you know, a, a great local following because of all the airplay. And we expanded on that. So we, it got to be where we really established ourselves in sort of the New England area. And so many gigs in Boston, because it'd be in a college town, we'd play, you know, Harvard Mixers and BU and all those places. And um, so I remember we, the, the, it came down to two labels that wanted us. It was Arista and Electra. And we met with both of them the same night. And the, the difference in the meetings is, is kind of funny. We, first, we met with Clive Davis and Bob Fiden at Ken's Pub on Boylston Street and had a very civilized, nice dinner. And yeah, they were Arista, right? Yeah, those guys. Yeah, were, yeah, yeah. yeah, it was Clive Davis. Clive was Arista. And, and Arista was new. And, um, you know, we talked and stuff. At the time, they, were, they, they didn't have a lot of rock and roll. They had the Outlaws and Patti Smith, and they just had signed Dwight Twilley. And the rest of it was like Anita Baker and, you know, R&B &B yeah. kind of stuff like that, that Clive later proved to be his forte with Whitney and all that kind of stuff. So we, we decided, you know, and then there's Electra, which like they never put out a bad record. If it had, had the, the Electra, doors, you Jeez. could buy it, you know. <laughs> so so we went from Ken's Pub across the across the Charles River to Cambridge to the Sinesta Hotel. And we met with two guys from Electra to dinner with Clive and Bob, everything's so nice and proper. We go in these guys and there's like a jar this big of talcum powder on, 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 on the coffee table and they're going crazy and they're like, yeah, man. <laughs> and it was just the craziest thing. But in the end, they, they acceded to a couple of points that our manager wanted. And it, it was the right decision to go with Electra. But the whole way it happened was Max Ann playing our little demo tape. So, so you you felt a little more at home with uh, people, you know, that weren't so buttoned up. I guess you know. Well, it wasn't really that. I mean, we we weren't like you know, like hey, these guys are like you know, party, and we should sign with them. It was more <laughs> that you know, it was Electra Records because those guys didn't sign us. Joe Smith signed us. Yeah. You know, we met with them, and if any, if they would have done anything, it would have been turned to turn us off with with, with you know with the craziness. But it was just funny. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, you and I know that Electra had the, the Butterfield band. You know? Butterfield, and what's the doors, shaking? You know, what's shaking record? I mean, yeah, the, I mean, know, that, love. So, so uh, you know, I'm going to just go bolt in and out of stuff. Okay, so we'll leave the yeah. cars there. Cars get signed. Right. Um, some somebody had asked I, our friend uh, wanted to know that exactly what you talked about. Uh, it, Brian McNulty from Denver wanted to know about the big break at WBCM, but then he also said, "Did you ever run out to the car and wait for yourself to come on the radio?" Uh, no, we did better than that. We were so tight with WBCN that while we were recording "Shake It Up" in our studio in Boston, we sent it over to BCN, and they didn't announce it, so nobody could record it. We went in Roy Thomas Baker's limo and sat back and listened to it on his car stereo. Oh boy. And then you knew it was a final mix or not. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we had the little aura tones that everybody used to, to check, you know, car radio sound, but we could actually get the radio station because Roy said, no, no, we have to hear it with the radio compressor. <laughs> He's right. He's, He's right. He was right. They're fantastic. Well, I, also, records. you know, I, I'm telling the story of getting signed. Let me tell you the story, how we got Roy Thomas Baker oh, yeah. as a producer, because this was kind of funny too. So we, we got signed to Electra. So the next step was to make the record. And so we, we were looking around and, and, and approaching producers and people approaching for us. And the first guy we approached was this guy, Gary Lyons. And he had just done Foreigner, the first Foreigner album. And it was a big record. And he passed on us. But the funny thing is, is he was... Roy, Roy Thomas Baker was his mentor and taught him everything. And Roy grabbed us. <laughs> yeah, of course. What happened, uh, you know, we, we were looking at producers. Well, he didn't teach him everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah he well, got you. yeah. Bingo. Yeah. But, but uh, our, our manager, then manager brought Roy. It was a snowed out gig at a college in Worcester, Mass, a Holy Trinity College. And it was like a student union, big gym with like 12 people in it. And we're like, Jesus, you know, uh, this Roy Thomas Baker, who just did Bohemian Rhapsody, is coming here to check us out, you know, and there's nobody here. And he loved us. And he, 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 after, after we finished playing, you know, he came, came over and he was like a Monty Python character. He was like, oh, hello, my dears. Yeah, you know, right, yeah. Hello, love. Uh, would you like to go to England and make a record? And we're like, oh yeah, that sounds pretty good to us, <laughs> you know? And, and it all went from there and we ended up, you know, at Air, London. Do you remember, um, that's, it's amazing that he had sort of a, I think he probably dug having a private audience with you almost. It was almost like, you know, he could he was just. Great. I mean, we did four records with him. You know, uh, what well, do you remember? Do you remember? Well, back up one second about that gig, right? Yeah. Uh, your your what? Do you remember the, any of the, any any of the song lists? Were you playing any covers? Was it all? Had all of this whole album been written already? Yeah. The whole. Yeah, we're album. basically playing the the first album and other songs too. Yeah, I mean, some yes, yes, some were expo were, were were kind of revealed on the radio. We know that. But so no covers. The band wasn't a cover band. Uh, it wasn't a cover band, but but in our club days, we did a few select ones for fun. Rick uh, liked to sing the Brenton Wood, give me some, give me some kind of sign, girl. Oh, that must have been really unique. <laughs> and we did. It was the Cars doing, give me some kind of sign. And we did uh, Don't Worry, Baby. Yeah, yeah. And um, he wanted to do this soft machine song called We Did It Again. And it's all it was was We Did It Again. We did it again. So I said, well, why don't we go into You Really Got Me, at least, from there. Yeah, so we, you, well, you so know, that's your sense of uh, <laughs> a medley from Soft Machine to the Kinks. We played just, just a few, you know, just a few songs for fun. Uh, we played Love is the Drug. Oh, the, yeah. Uh, oh, that's perfect. Yeah, that's we, a perfect. More sense. But, you know, I'll tell you the funny thing about the cars. You know, we have that image of being very cool and, and, and you know, sharp and, 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 you know, a little icy and 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 uh, aloof or something like that, you know, because of the clothes and the sunglasses and everything like that. But really, we were like five old hippies. But who you know, was that, the image guru then? Or was it just amongst yourself? You decided we're going to, was there a guy in the band or somebody outside the band that said, you guys should look like this? Was this, you know, after the after the record was coming out or were well, you already into this look by the time the great saw question. you? I'll yeah. tell you, uh, David. Ro I give David Robinson, our drummer, credit for all of it. He was sort of like the band's art director. Yeah, 
in in the early days, we, we, you know, we wanted to look like a band. So we said, let's, you know, we'll wear black and white because you can get away with, we, we had no money. So we could wear a black t-shirt and some black jeans and we look like a band together. Yeah. You know, just a t-shirt and jeans. And, 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 and after that, we expanded a little well, bit. Well, it was Ramon's know. concept originally. It kind <laughs> of, you know, I mean, was, we wanted to look like a band because what happened was, see, I know I'm going all over the place, but it's because you're asking me. Good no, questions. it's all part. This is all part of the image. Okay, well, here's what happened. Part of what led to that. Uh, I was in a band with Rick and Ben just before the cars called Captain Swing. And that band did a showcase at Max's Kansas City in New York for O'Coin and for Lieber and Krebs, the big managers. They They're very big. Yeah. Aerosmith, Kiss, you know. Later on, O'Coin had Billy Idol. So we played and... Our image was all over the place. They said, You're first of all, Ben wasn't playing bass. He was just singing lead. We had a bass player with a Guild Starfire that he sent to a Lembic and it was covered with knobs like Cassidy yeah. and Lush. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah. he had Alembic cabinets and a Macintosh amp and an Alembic preamp. So we had a guy that looked like he should be in the dead. Had another guy. Well, Danny Lewis was playing. Well, Danny, Rose. who we both know, he's in yeah, with Governor Mule now, a good friend of both of ours. Yeah, yeah well, he was. My, I, I met him at school at Berkeley in 72. And um, and we had a drummer who was like, thought he was Billy Cobham with press rolls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's it, it, it's Rick's songs. All he wanted was, you know, big two, four beat. And, and so they gave us some really good constructive criticism. They said, look, fellas, the songs are great but your image is all over the place. Like your bass player looks like he should be roadieing for the Grateful Dead. Yeah. Ben was wearing this embarrassing peach colored silk karate gi that his wife made for him <laughs> and, and wasn't playing bass. No, he was just up front, which is right. He was awful. up front <laughs> and, and the songs were like longer and a little jammier. And they said, can you, you need to make a more concise yeah. And you need to tighten up your image. You don't, you're all over the place. One guy, one guy looks like he's in the velvet underground. One guy looks like he's in the grateful dead. And so we went back to Boston. We took, we didn't like, we took the right attitude. Like we went back kind of like with our tails between our legs and said, you know, they're right. And so we busted that band up and we got David in on drums and Greg came back because Greg had worked with them in Richard and the rabbits. Greg, but in the meantime, he was one of Martin Mull's fabulous furnitures. Oh. <laughs> on, on sax, on yeah. saxophone. Yeah. So Greg came back on keyboards. We put Ben back on bass where he belonged. And that was the cars. And, and, and then David, he, he created the logo that looks like kind of like a license yeah, plate. Yeah, yeah, it's great. And yeah. all, all the album covers, he worked very you know closely with the art department at the labels. And a lot of it was his, his ideas and his artwork. So... Well, you know, the same thing happened to a little band from Liverpool, if, if you recall. You know, they were dressed like Gene Vincent, mm. you know, and, yeah. and Brian Epstein said to them, you have to this, you know, they got the haircuts from Astrid, you know, and right. then Brian dressed them up in the suits, which they're very uncomfortable and they're not that. But but it but it 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 set the table for the well, British the, invasion. Well, the, the famous quote, you know, Epstein said to them, Epstein, Epstein, I don't know, yeah. Epstein, said to them. You know, if you want to make real money and play real shows, you're not going to be able to, you got to get out of that leather and into some smart suits. Yeah. And Lennon said, Lennon said, I'll wear an effing balloon on my head if it makes me some money. That's right. That's right. They were, they were hungry and, and they were open. So you guys were open. You know, it's funny because you get you know, the Lennon, idea. Lennon played the game and then cursed the game. Of course he did. Of course, it, John would tear down everything once he got inside of it. <laughs> From the outside, you can't tear anything down, you know. No, but 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 the, the the myth was maintained for so long of the Fab Four until yeah. seventy one, and he did that Rolling Stone interview they made in the book Lennon Remembers, which was a crazy interview where he put everything down and not. Oh yeah, yeah, and, he, not, and I think he, I think later he, he actually said, you know, I was a little. A little just like crazy on that interview where he just says all the oh that's right. rubbish the greatest songs trash Paul's huh. you know yeah. whatever but yeah. you know the funny thing is too he claimed that, he wrote most of Eleanor Rigby in that interview oh yeah I know and then somebody said Ringo wrote a lot of it too and George had had his hand in it too she said there there's an interview where he just says where Paul just says uh, 
uh, oh, I have the opening line. I'll leave it to you, you know, <laughs> to the rest of the guys. Yeah, uh, yeah. you know, and who knows? And who cares? Actually, everyone. <laughs> but but that they're dressing up. Their look opened the door. On the other hand, for the Stones to be the antithesis of that, and to come That's on weird. Ed Sullivan with a sweatshirt with a stain on it. I mean, you know, I'm surprised the producers at Ed Sullivan didn't say, "No, you can't go on like that." And that. The Stones built that image of, of uh, you know. Oh, absolutely. I think I remember they played Hollywood Palace with Dean Martin first. And he wrote, he said, aren't they great? And rolled his eyes and the audience yeah. laughed. Yeah. You know, and he was making fun of them, and, you know. The barbers so, and so you guys, of, of course, um, uh, you're, you being younger. Yeah. May have had a bit of a, if those guys are eight or nine years or older or seven or whatever, they were they were older when Beatlemania hit. They probably were more into some other stuff. They were as old as the Beatles. Yeah, right. So <laughs> so you know, yeah, so right. So they weren't like you and me in awe of this. You know, I I am I can't imagine. Do you know any of the other influences uh from the guys in the band? I'm, I'm yeah, of course of know. course I do. Yeah. Um, you know, Greg and I had a lot of common ground and Greg Greg loved Beatles and uh the Beach Boys like I did and and then Rick and I loved Dylan together. Yeah, yeah. And then Rick loved like stuff like Velvet Underground, which I had zero interest in, and John Cale and stuff yeah. like that. Or even Roxy Music, I had zero interest in. I I, I like the band and Taj Mahal. You yeah, know what I like. Yeah. You know, and, and that's the funny thing, you know, about the fact that I ended up in this band, The Cars, because all my practicing at home and all my trying to learn licks and everything would not have indicated that I would end up in this cool calculating kind of Anglo sort of band because I was a very sort of into American music. Yeah. I know you and I are both Mike Bloomfield nuts. Absolutely. Know? And, and that, you know, that Butterfield band being the first yeah, integrated of course the band. Be, you know, Beatles, yeah. Stones, of course I loved, you know, and I loved Cream and I, it's not that I didn't love English music. But it just was, it's funny that I would have ended up in a band that people would compare to like Roxy or. Well, I can hear that in Rick's vocals, you know, and and that's that's another thing. Um, If not, it's almost like the same thing happened to Steely Dan, you know, they had Palmer in there singing, you know, and he had a certain sound. You can hear the songs and Ben, too. They both have fabulous voices. And Ben if I'm if I'm not wrong, had the first and last hit, uh, I believe he sang the bookend uh, hits of just what I needed. And uh, is it drive? Drive, huh? drive. Yeah. And and he, and every time he sings, though, you know, it's very rare other than the Beatles and the band and a lot a lot of bands like that where you hear two lead singers, but the band's sound doesn't change. It doesn't right. go away. You know who they are. And but Rick is quirky in a way vocally, uh, which I can hear the David Byrne and and, and Brian Ferry influence. Yeah, uh, and Dylan too, where Rick would say, "I can sing," you know. Absolutely. But somebody might have said, some A and R guy might have said, "This guy's terrible," you know. I mean, I don't know, but but to but me, it's like Leon Russell too. You yeah, know, it, it's like a, a character voice. Well, and it's like when Donald Fagan finally took the reins as the lead singer of Steely Dan, which was after the first record. You know, he, right. he obviously, yeah. And, and even though, you know, there might have been technically better singers, it wouldn't have been informed with, the you know, his knowledge of having written it and, and the deep feeling he would have for the song. Right. And being a better actor, because that's yeah. what lead so singing it, is. Know, yeah. It's right. just going to have an element to it. But, but in our band, like Rick wrote all the songs and Rick, they'd sit down and divvy them up. And Rick would always joke that he would always give Ben the ones that required a, like a good singer. A little more range or whatever. He wasn't yeah. kidding, you know. Um, and so that's kind of, you know, they, they just kind of like worked it out between themselves. As I said earlier, they'd been working together for a real long time. So they had their like MO down already, you know. So there was no, um, there was no hard feelings about who was singing what in that. No, that no. They're totally, oh, that's great. That's great to Not hear. Not at all. And, and uh, there, there's misconceptions. You guys were labeled a new wave band. Oh my God, you're a rock and roll band, you know? I mean, well, you, but you probably were one of the first in the forefront of what they were calling new wave, maybe because of the look, maybe because of, you know, a lot of bands were copying you guys already after the first record. 
So, well, that's um, that's that's where image comes in, and and is like so. Like we're talking about the Beatles, and the first Beatles we saw were cute guys in little suits with their hair neat and everything like that. But these guys were hitters from Liverpool in leather. You know, these were tough guys. They'd already, you know, been th- through Hamburg and everything like that. I can't imagine like that that the Romantics weren't Cars fans, okay? Oh, that's what I was going to say about like being called like a new wave band or this or that. You know, there's the journalistic terms. I mean, we we didn't know what we called. We would. It was just like what the five of us sounded like playing together. Right. Imagine call, imagine go, going back to 1968 and telling Levon and and Rick and those guys and and Emmanuel and even Robbie that you guys are an Americana band. Yeah. <laughs> you know. I mean, that, that, there was no there was no box for them. And the same thing the same thing goes for the Ramones. Johnny was adamantly pissed about being called a punk band. They were just a rock band, you know. They they were playing girl group songs really loud and fast in their mind. They but were it's the funny heads, because you know? yeah, I remember when that you know in the early days that they were really credited with inventing it. So yeah. that must have really ticked them off. Well, you know, it may and 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 to a point, uh, he was always pissed off anyway. Sure, sure. He oh, he was stuck. he was a card carrying. Uh, forget it, you know. Oof. But <laughs> but I loved him. Uh, anyway, I really loved what he did and what he brought. His 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 snarkiness was a big part of that band. So yeah. Uh, um, so um, let's get into Roy and you. And now you you had really demos, or I don't know if they were finished. I want to talk about your guitar solos a little bit. Uh, a lot of us, um, I know me, if somebody calls me for a session, I, I just say either, now today it's like, send me the track. You know, they're not even there, which is not good. Okay, I Or that. I would walk into a session and play my stuff, you know, like, because I was like a Steely Dan freak, I was always thinking in terms of what Larry would play, or, you know, or, or what Mike Bloomfield would play over these jazz changes as a blues player. Mm. Um, and just go for it. Now, you have what, what I call some of the greatest crafted solos on those records, all part of the package that made it work. It's not like, oh, he's just taken off and, and wanking and showing us his chops. These were crafted in the way George Harrison's uh, solos were later well, crafted. thank you. You know, no, they, they are. Like something didn't, ju- the, the, the solo on something, it didn't just come out, <laughs> you know? It's built. It's, it's, it's. It's written. You can't not play it, you know? It, it's composed. It's composed. And, and I, I feel the same way about your solos, but Very how nice. did that process work with you? I mean, when you, you guys learn the song, right? Rick shows you the chords. You start working on it. Time to go, okay? Yeah. So, well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what. At, you know, with, with the first album, we, we just, we made that record in 12 days. And I did all my guitar parts in a day and a half. Because all we were doing we was playing our club set. So I just sort of regurgitated everything on tape. Then comes the second record and all new songs. And that begins really where, I mean, I, I, it was the same process when we were you know, playing clubs. I would sit at home and work out the solos. Um, but when we started making records, I, I, I developed this routine I would do. And... Well, first of all, Roy, as people know from Queen and et cetera, is famous for his massive background vocals, you know, like 80, 100 voices in the background. And to do that in the analog era, you needed a lot of empty tracks. And Roy had a very unique t- recorder machine, tape recorder. It wasn't a 3M24 track or anything uh, yeah. like that. He had a Stevens 40 track on two inch. Whoa. (laughs) He had 40 tracks on two inch tape. So the tracks are obviously much narrower, but he had a lot more open tracks. But even with all those tracks, you know, he wanted to have lots of tracks to like gang vocals, bounce them more, bounce them more about. So the the way we would do it is we would record a basic track to the song and either Rick or Ben would put just a, a guide vocal so we'd know where we are in the song and so we'd know where the holes were, of course. And then we'd go right into background vocals so that th- th- Roy had all the empty tracks he needed. And the process for the background vocals, it was Ben, Greg, and myself. We were called the Singing Background Brothers. Yeah. And it, it was Leaf, 
Amos and Denton. <laughs> I, I imagined you were in the middle somewhere. I was Leaf. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but Ben was Denton. And uh, Who's the high, Ben is the high stuff, the high, the high arts. Yeah, oh, sure. Yeah. 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 But, but, but that's not how Roy did it. He would put three of us on a mic and have us sing one part oh. together oh. seven, eight, nine times. Oh, boy. And then he'd bounce all that down to say two step to a stereo to two tracks. Yeah. And he would do it again of a three part harmony. And the next one up, three of us singing the same part, the, you know, the third. Uh, or whatever, you know, the second part of the harmony, three of us, seven, eight, nine times, bounce them down. And so he needed lots and lots of tracks to be able to do all this. So what I would do with regards to the guitar solos is as soon as we did recorded the basic track with a guide vocal, I'd have the engineer run me a cassette of that. And I'd go back to the hotel or home or whatever condition, wherever we were staying in the world. And I'd work on my solos while we were doing background vocals. Yeah. And I had, you know, several weeks, you know, in some cases before we got to guitars, maybe even a month or more before we got to guitars. And so, you know, probably like you, you know, I'd sit down with the song and here's this empty 12, 16 bars that I've got to fill. And I, I'd listen to the song and I'd, I'd think about it and, with, you know, with everything that you've learned up until that point, you know, you just a sum total of everything that you've ever heard. Yeah, you have a toolbox. Yeah, a little yeah. Rolodex in your head. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. And so, you know, the first thing I think of was like, what's my entry? How do I get into this solo and take off from the vocal in a cool way where it sounds right? Yeah. And, and, and then like it followed from there. And usually my entry often would be, some as logic would would dictate was with like sort of a variation on the melody yeah that kind of take off on the melody and then extrapolate a little bit and go off so i think what's my door into the solo and then i'd you know find that and then i'd add to it and add to it and then i'd think all right how do i set this solo down gracefully now so that Ben could come back in and it, it's not jarring. It doesn't go yeah. from a crazy high screaming thing and then he's going to come. So it had to make sense, you know, in that way. So, you know, it's just like any kind of like art. It's got a, like a beginning, a middle and an end. And and you're a naturally uh, an arranger. OK, so, you know, a music arranger, which is some, something that, you know, if, if, if they, you know, you get Nelson Riddle gets handed a. A, a song for Frank Sinatra, what are the strings going to do? How are they going to support the vocal? In right. some, it's always, that's an arranger's head. That's from you listening to records and, and hearing those, yeah. those James Burton solos on the Ricky Nelson records, which are some of the most important little eight bar things in, in well, our all lives. Of it. Yeah. Well, you're right. And, and, and just all of it, not just the solo, but like, what's a hook? And yeah. how, how does yeah. it repeat itself at the end of every chorus? You wait for it to come back around. Well, that's because we're guys that read every word on the record, every word on the jacket, every word on the liner notes, you know. But Jimmy, the first time you heard Day Tripper without knowing it was called a hook, you yeah. sure as hell were hooked. Yeah, the riff. And you know, and let me, I'm going to quickly tell you a funny story because you told me about your vocal background vocal process. Yeah. And then I'm going to ask you to, to, to show us some something. Uh, but we'll, we'll uh -oh. grab an example. <laughs> but I had the opportunity to record, um, you know, that that that, that uh, Carl Wilson, Al Jardine, and Al's son Matt were going to come in and do some background vocals for me on something I was working on. And oh wow! So I wrote them out, you know, and uh, and 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 uh, Carl said, uh, "Carl, I'm working with Carl Wilson. I'm like, I, I am forget it, Gaga, one of the greatest singers and ever, you know, and." Uh, <laughs> And and he and I said okay so here's your here's who's on bottom uh, uh, says Matt's going to be on top Matt's going to be where Brian would be you know Al will be in in and then and then I'll be in the middle you know and, and but then he said but that's I was saying that I was saying Matt should be on top and he said no 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 we should all sing one track together so let's that's all what start what you did and I had never heard of that until then and now you say it to me and I and I and I understand I said well. Okay, so three guys on each part, and then we doubled that, so we had six guys. Did they, were they able to read? No, no, I, I just, I, Carl had his guitar like he always did, and, uh, you know, I had, my suggestions, of course, were trumped, or 
I hate that word, were over, they were overlooked uh, um, or, or actually bettered by Carl saying, what if we do this? I said, you know what? I just did that because I don't know, you know, you know, the process. He said, just play me the track and, and give me an idea of what you want. And then he way bettered my vocals, you know? And then in the end, I believe Matt sang the bass part. He sang the fourth part. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, um, Carl said to me, only double that. Don't make it three. Don't make it, you know, you only need two of those. You don't need a lot on the bot. That's what they did, you know. They, they knew always, so well. They knew he so knew well. so well. He said it only needs to be doubled. It gets funny if it's too many on the bottom, you know. And uh, and so experienced. I walked away them. learning so much. And, hey, you don't, uh, you know, a genius like that. You kind of say, here's the track. What would you do? You know, they're not. I, they're I, not I figure any band that recorded our prayer knows a little something about harmony. Oh yeah, yes. Yeah. So they, you know. Anyway, that was enlightening to me that you say you guys use the same process. Well, that was Roy's method. That Even though the Beach, Beach Boys did actually all sing all five at once and then double it, you know, uh, that that was due to lack of track space, you right. know. But right. this is more of a specter idea of everybody on the same part, and then again, and then again, yeah. and then yeah, mix this it was, down. You know, that was Roy all the way over the top, the you greatest. Know, the greatest. You can't have too much of anything. All the needles pinned in the red. He didn't care. He and would, another Beatle freak, by the way, too. You know? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so uh, let's get he to let's to pick a solo uh, that that from from any song you want and and break it down for us. Play it and then break All it right. down for us if you don't well, we mind. We were talking. We were talking about just what I needed before, and I, yeah, I've got the Les Paul in my lap here. So why don't we why don't we yeah. look at that one? Why don't we adjust your camera too so we can see the guitar? Okay. Yeah, and your hands. Great. Yeah. Okay. okay. Great. So, um, well, so so the chords for the solo. Oh, by the way, there's nothing nothing wrong with your screen. Elliot is left-handed. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. It should be mirror image. If yes. you're right-handed, your neck should be going in the same direction. Yes. Yes. So the chords are like I want to hold your hand. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Same as just when I did. Okay, so that's basically the solo. And so, uh, well, I'll play it. You know, I, I'm playing through the through the chord changes in, in in a way like say that a jazz musician would do, except on a much more you know basic level. It's just a rock song, but the 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 concept of playing through the chords rather than just staying in the key of the song and just wailing away on like bluesy rock licks. That's kind of the point I'm trying to make. So it goes from E to B. So it goes. Right. Yeah. Got that third in the A sharp. Oh, that's the magic note. Right. And then. A the second time. Not yep. A. Yep. E to B. There's the there's the G sharp again. It's I call this solo fun with thirds. <laughs> yeah. And then and then you know. Uh, so. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, all together. It's, And okay, that's... would you would you do it one more time and turn the delay off for us here, if you don't mind? Okay. Yeah. Because as much as I love that's the record sound, it's it'll be clearer to us because it's really great when you land those thirds because you obviously know there's a change that it's not just the blues in a box, you know. No, and then and, you and you get a solo that you can whistle. And I can see the linear movement up and down the neck to the chords that you're right. That you know, and and that's a great that's a great uh, thing that people should know. Uh, that that's what boy nailing those thirds on those chords that are they're yeah, outside it's, you know, and, it, yeah. and it and it and it gives it a melodic contour that you know my my I'm gonna go up here for a minute yeah um, you know my my whole idea about playing music was I never wanted to be a guitar player 
that just played for other guitar players. I wanted to play that people could hear it and, and enjoy it and walk away whistling my solo. That's it. Yeah. You know, and it's part of the song. And that's what I always tried to do. I think mission accomplished, you know, because I, I mean, I, I get so many wonderful comments about the solos from those records and I did work real hard on them to craft them. And um, so, okay, I'll try, I'll, I'll go back down to the hands and I'll play it without the delay. Yeah. Yeah. Just to, just to clear it up for the, okay. the, 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 the listeners. Yeah. All right. You're just in time without like talking about it. Just go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's clearer for me. You know, I love the crop. I love the Steve Cropper finish too. Oh, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's from like every soul record, right? That we heard. That's like Soul Man on acid. <laughs> yeah, I know we're both Cropper heads for sure. Oh, for There's sure. a guy that played the perfect part every time. And and for me too, Cornell. Yeah, Cornell. Well, so Cornell much. Dupree, who we, I, 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 I was so in awe of, and I used to go see him playing at McKell's up close. You know. Oh, it's good stuff. He, yeah, he came a place called Manny's Car Wash up up uptown to play with me one night. Wow. And he, I swear to God, he played ten interesting uh, choruses of blues in a row on my gold top. He borrowed my gold top. It has not cooled off since then, and he built it like as you know, you don't come out swinging. You know, he, right. he came and he built it, this solo, and it just, it's something people don't understand. Uh, young people, a lot of young players, and me as a young player at the time, had the advantage of learning that, oh, you don't just come out and play your shit. And then you're done in 12 bars. You have nothing left to say. I think, I think there was genius in Cornell. Yeah. And, you know, you only, it's like you only saw the tip of the iceberg in a way. Oh, his kind of, rhythm on Soul Serenade is just... You know, you know it's, like, it's like the way Count Basie band sacrificed Freddie Green to the rhythm section. Freddie was a great soloist, but for 50 years, chump, chump, because they, he was the glue. He was a great drummer, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but 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 Macy gave him full credit for being so important in that rhythm section, and they would joke that they, they sacrificed him to the rhythm section because he they needed him. But what do we say now? You know, this it's funny. You've really made it when a player when I do a session and uh, the producer says something, and I just write over the chart Freddie Green, <laughs> you know, and the drummer will write Hal Blaine. Yeah, you know. These these session and you and I both know um, that we we had to know who these guys were right on on the right. sessions, you know and 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 these women and Carol Kay, yeah. <laughs> but it's a drum. It's a it's the James Brown thing. Yeah. <laughs> 